Hi, I'm Ali Words, and this is Last Unrifled Yaw. Last Unrifled Yaw is a podcast where we have conversations about video art, experimental music, avant-garde literature, performance art, and the occult. If you or someone you know would like to be on Last Unrifled Yaw, please get in touch. Keats Ross is an interdisciplinary artist and musician writing a multimedia haunt manual about nostalgia mancy. Hey everyone, this is Ali Words, and today we have Keats Ross. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Keats? Hi, yes, sure. My name is Keats Ross. I am a writer of, you know, journalistic things, of long-form fiction. I help run the artistic anarchic collective called We the Hallowed. Um, I write music and perform and work in with an audiomantic praxis. Jeez, I'm struggling here. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, you do a lot of audiomancy. And we actually had um, Lux Estrada on episode four, right. I think it was, to talk about audiomancy too. Yeah, she's great. So yeah, I guess my head's just befuddled. You know, I've been working on something as of late called the Haunt Manual, which is this kind of personal journey into the contradiction that uh, spills out from the macro to the micro um, and throughout all of my artistic pursuits, throughout all of my magical pursuits. And it's not only kind of opened up a lot of doors in my mind, a lot of cavities um, to spelunk within, but it's also scrambled a lot. So I'm, I'm constantly thinking about this huge nebulous idea of not only what I do, but what the purpose is. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the stasis of which you find me right now is as in a sort of befuddled amusement by all of the the myriad of different things that I dip my toes in. But at the same time, you know, trying to find that continuum between them all. And it runs through uh, music as in my audiomancy practices, uh, which I've been doing for a very long time. I actually have an essay, a video essay on it on YouTube, and it's also written on wethehallow.org. And I talk about my early experiments of meditation and tape splicing, cassette tape splicing, excuse me, and making mutant melodies and, and odd songs to kind of conjure a metaphysical and artistic praxis within music. But I also, you know... Um, do the same sort of things for video art and video mancy, as I call it. And again, these are insular. I use the terms audio mancy or video mancy as more of a, a generalized idea of metaphysically, you know, art minded practices within these mediums. So not cornering the idea of audio mancy, right? Um, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I've been working with Prag Magic, which is my podcast that I've had for over 60 plus episodes now and am starting to retool it into this fluid haunt manual which will not only talk about all of my metaphysical practices but also you, like the genesis of all of them and trying to commune the contradiction within myself of uh, what it means to be kind of a, a modern artist while still you know holding a big light to outsiderdom and as it communes through with writing and fiction and projects like Dakota Slim which is my main solo musical output but also We the Hallowed which was you know it started as a live in-person kind of art collective where we had a residency in Portland and it was live salons every month where we did a variety show so and that's when I started Prag Magic was I was interviewing kind of magically minded artists uh, in front of an audience. And then I just started going full throttle with it as a podcast. But now this new chapter is kind of finding the tethers that twine in between all of these from We the Hallowed to Dakota Slim to me as a writer or a magician, quote unquote. And... Uh, finding all the things that bind that sinew in between so that's that's where i'm at these days interesting there are a bunch of questions that come up from that i think the one that is perhaps most interesting is 
you you say that there's some sort of conflict about being a modern artist shining a light on outsiderdom. And I, I want to add a twist to that question. When you say modern artists, do you actually mean like modernism versus postmodernism versus whatever's happening now? Or do you mean just like contemporary? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I mean it specifically personally, but as I've said, the micro and the macro too. Um, it does come through in a lot of not only how I am kind of giving thanks or a, a sort of resolve to the things that influence me, but creating not something new, but something filtered through my own paradigm, right? And sometimes that is thought of as postmodernist, um, but I never really look at it in terms of those generalities or those like artistic movements, even though, you know, I've been supremely and pun intended uh, uh, influenced by suprematism and Kazimir Malevich, an early 20th century revolutionary Russian painter who, you know, wrote a manifesto about suprematism and this idea of giving the artist back the subjectivity and foregoing kind of an academic generalization, right, of art or, you know, of that kind of, I don't want to say elitist, but in, in that class of understanding of what art is and generalities, as opposed to just a subjective entanglement one has as the artist and one has as a viewer. So yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's both. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, have, I've been reading a little bit of uh, this book recently called The Radicant by, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong because it's French, but it looks like Bro. <laughs> I was definitely wrong. Briard, <laughs> perhaps. But he, uh, it kind of reminds me of the basic premise, at least how you pitched it right here, of the Haunt Manual, because uh, the Radicant, he juxtaposes with the Radical. So the Radical is, uh, in the way he's using the terms, someone who is defining themselves by the soil that they grow in in order to reach forward as an avant-garde towards new horizons whereas the radicant takes as its manner of organization um, vines like i think he uses ivy specifically as a radicant in that it advances in all directions and adheres itself to every surface that it comes across without being defined uh, from a singular soil that it's growing from it's like wrapping around and piecing together every surface that it encounters. See, I absolutely adore that. Uh, there's so many things to pick apart in just that, especially me personally, as I work, my kind of day job is uh, outdoor education and survival skills. So it is very much ripped out of this um, kind of you know, hard-boiled, heavy, heavy intellectualism of the creative stuff I do you know, to contrast that outside of and using the, you know, the idea of the vines and, and the soil has come up a lot for me and trying to explain, you know, that sort of contradiction. So that's quite beautiful. I'm definitely going to look into that. Yeah, there'll be a link in the description for everyone. So is there in this haunt manual, what kinds of it sounds like it, you're trying to elaborate the ways in which, at least you personally, uh, your practice is interdisciplinary. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, sure. I think it's more, yeah, interdisciplinary is fine. I do believe in the reverence given to the sorts of things that are pick and pulled, but I'm I'm definitely going off of more of a, like just a mutated imaginarium kind of based thing there's a lot of like i said tethers to those inner disciplines but at the same time i'm 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 kind of finding and resourcing going back to the roots of you know before i was so knowledgeable of um all of these high ideas of creation and magical praxis and, you know, my working with kids has brought up this idea of just, you know, kind of uh, calling back the world of which, you know, I, I was birthed in and how I saw the world um, before the over-intellectualizing of these things. Of course, you're not going to 
supersede that because unfortunately somebody with my brain disfluencies is always going to be um overthinking uh everything so it's it really is a praxis to kind of know that but at the same time allowing a mutation of sorts and really communing with the contradiction of both of needing to be something very personal and organic organic but also you know it being kind of spawned from perhaps um you know archetypal ideas but really just personal um interactions with the world and you know through this brain filter that i have and i do see a lot and i talk about it in the first chapter i do see a lot of the archetypal ideas and i do see how it might be redundant in a lot of ways uh for a lot of people um that are confined within this sort of contradictory search between a lot of these things and i'm okay with that um and so i just kind of follow suit back onto this is really just a an expression of everything that came before, you know, in hopes of igniting something new from myself. Hmm. So what's your process like working on this haunt manual? Yeah, so that's another thing. It's um, the haunt manual itself is really trying to tether all of the projects together. So um, not only did it, does it spawn from things that kind of inspire me or, you know, shake me down and, and ideas of, you know, more research or talking about things, you know, I talk about how it's funny that the, uh, the philosophical idea of the pharmacon has been coming up in my head recently. And it's been this kind of ghostly idea that I've always toiled with since high school when I released my first zine and its name was pharmacon and, so it's a lot of meditation kind of and what I call nostalgiamancy, um, kind of this like hauntology of the self uh, of remembering, you know, the inspirational bits and bops that spawned a lot of these trajectories, but at the same time, kind of giving them due reverence of where I am now. And so there's a lot of meditation, uh, a lot of meditative practices, but it's also I'm utilizing audiomancy. I'm doing um, these live improvisational, you know, just going with one kind of key and playing um, live with no kind of written uh, trajectory whatsoever in front of me. And it also is a study of what comes up to me, what are the, you know, prevailing kind of notes or, uh, are like musical movements that I see kind of generate and turn and then turn into new things. And I use that as the underlying score for the audio portion of the haunt manual, which is me kind of reading this chapter that I wrote that encompasses all of that. And so it, it works within a lot of different artistic paradigms, like the podcast and we, the hallowed where it will be an article format, but it also utilizes a lot of the practices too to generate, um, you know, each thing. So it really is a journalistic um, kind of culling of everything that I've done before uh, into a mishmash moving forward. A fluid mishmash, but a mishmash nonetheless. When you say musical movement, what do you mean by that exactly? So I'm imagining you, you pick like A minor or something. And then you hop on, I think you mainly play guitar and you, uh, you, you kind of just yeah. go for it. And then something that you're calling a musical movement emerges organically. Yeah. So in the first case, I'm playing guitar. I'll, I'll be playing a bunch of other things and actually um, it, it'll kind of go more intricate as the time goes. But this first installment was, you know, very uh, tight praxis in that I'm, you know, kind of using the nostalgiamancy through music where um, I give myself, you know, a key and I'm finding that I'm unlocking rhythms or uh, movements from songs I have written in the past that I have not played and forever um, kind of organically pop up. And so you then mean like physical movements of your arms and hands playing. Well, that and also musical movements like, you know, quote unquote riffs right or chord progressions 
or any of that. And I'm finding that I'm it's like a ghost is popping up of these old songs that I've forgotten will show up and then mutate into something completely new. And it's just kind of, you know, this sinew through this uh, unstopped 30 minute audiomantic process. That almost sounds a little bit like the way you described uh, some of your um, tape work, your audio yes. tape work. Um, I recently watched, I think it's called Dim the Zimzum, one of your videos yeah. where you talk about. It's kind of like a little bit like you're doing the same thing, but through yourself as opposed to the memories of what's on the radio. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, like the micro macro too, it's that, uh, that physical interaction, right. Versus the, say like the, uh, the drum machine, digital beats that are kind of, you know, were written in the past, but I'm just live kind of manipulating that are kind of already written there, but I'm also interacting with the music live in the physical space as it's, you know, being reverberated out. And it really is kind of this, you know, hauntological thing of rediscovering or unlocking, um, you know, old forgotten songs that, you know, I have stored away somewhere or like finding these different pathways to, to memory. Um, because memory has unfortunately been a big issue for me um, as of late through my struggles of, you know, in the past of drug addiction and um, a lot of undiagnosed, what I call mental disfluencies or, you know, um, yeah, things that um, were undiagnosed that went undiagnosed for a long time. And then after seeking some help and then, you know, figuring out things uh, to work within the confines of, and I talked to, I talked to, I talk about that, excuse me, um, in the first chapter of Haunt Manual of this, this want to be free of this sort of pharmacology, um, but am not yet able to, um, because I just haven't gained the right access or root, routinization or, or ritual even um, to work beyond that. And I think because of that, memory has been a big issue of mine. So it's also this really funny contradiction to use the term, and I'll, I'll probably say contradiction 8 million times in this, so forgive me. But um, the contradiction of, you know, wanting to purvey a new chapter, but being kind of stuck in the stasis by not being able to remember what to, to fix what came before, if that makes sense. And so I think about that in the audiomantic uh, part of the haunt manual too, where I'm sitting there and it's it's pretty broken down. I'm playing, you know, a, a, my baritone guitar and I'm I'm you know manipulating a drum machine, but at the same time I'm like unlocking these songs and these things that were never finished or if they were recorded I had wished they were recorded differently, um, and remembering that passion to like it, that our art is fluid and that nothing's ever really finished. And remembering that kind of, how do I put it? I don't want to say bravery. That sounds pompous. But maybe it is a sort of bravery and being like open to kind of uh, disregard the finality of what came before, but allow kind of the mutation to pick up the pieces of where it once was and, you know, find some solace and kind of moving forward with, with those art pieces or those songs right so are you familiar yeah. with aiden wachter yeah i am do you know uh, i'm gonna get the name wrong because i don't like actively practice his stuff but he has a number of rituals that involve working with like your past memories do you know about those i don't you know i i've heard aiden on friends podcasts and stuff but i've primarily just been so insular within my own stuff but i should definitely look these up yeah I, I think it might be i'm not sure if it's in weaving fate which was uh his book that's about hyper sigils or i think the fever stone might have some relation to it again i don't actively practice his rituals but he has uh some rituals where you you enter a trance and then you relive and modify past experiences that you had. Yeah. Um, I have another friend, 
named C.W. Chanter, and he talks about this a bit um, and kind of this... He, he he dumbs it down in the idea of like time travel, right? If like these these kind of um, nostalgia mantic right processes going to go back and and fix those like frayed tethers of what you've done before, and I I think that's interesting. I really do. I think my my prism right here is still trying to accept the tethers of what came before those frayed instances and mending them here you know 20 30 years later so i i dig that idea and i, I will definitely look into those hmm. you've uh, also said micro macro a few times could you explain the way you're using that yeah just in you know big principle to kind of a more of a generalized idea shared in a somatic reality versus you know just a very insular or personal um experience so like an objective subjective idea of these things but also to illustrate you know the the small and the big okay yeah yeah i was just wondering how that connects to this repeating theme of nostalgia mancy and um i don't have any strong opinions on reincarnation but what you were talking about with like needing to fix things that you've forgotten or at least rework with them almost sounds like some ideas of like memory loss through reincarnation. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I don't. I do find it funny. Um, I think my father said once, and I this hit home that he went and saw somebody about past lives and they told him that he was a, a young soldier that died in the war. And that's why after a certain age, it just felt like it was all new territory. Like everything was, you know, kind of unwritten and didn't know where to go from there. And that always kind of screamed out to me because it, it feels that way to me to a degree um, that around a certain age, it just, you know, kind of, it stopped being um, so resolute in kind of what I was doing or how I was feeling. Like every every tie that I had bound on me uh whether it be you know ideas of where i was going or you know um even columns of personality that i had built you know we're just kind of destructing all around all around me and i always felt that you know this that idea of just kind of having this unwritten thing would also work in this prism of the ghost right and past lives make sense of that of just having these um you know these what i call like the prada um in the haunt manual i describe the stasis of you know not being able to move forward i uh, bl be like blinking in static between like two cells of a film strip like burning through it it feels like in the bardo total what they call you know the preta the hungry ghosts these thin neck big bellied ghosts that are just insatiable and they're always looking for that same thing to uh you know to quell uh their thirst but are are never able to find it and so with me this is all an experiment and that i think that because i had grown into such an idea of what i term like the dharma bum which is this kind of our an anarchic idea of of freedom and not caring about you know, the rubble and the dust behind and starting fresh all the time that I, in fact, was, you know, carrying this ghost with me wherever I went and it would just rear its head again and I'd hit the stasis. So this is a big kind of undertaking and working uh, personally in that way to, you know, not only figure out the things that inspire me, right, to move forward, and to remember, have the nostalgiamancy of the, you know, the abandon or the, you know, the whims and fancies of, you know, what inspired me as a kid. Um, but also to kind of exorcise the unhealthy revolutions that I find myself in. Um, because it's never the city, right, that you move to. It's never, never the environment. It's always you. And you're just always bringing, and I mean the royal you. Not you personally, but you know it's 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 you wherever you go, 
And um, so it's, it's, you know, figuring out how in the, ma in the macro sense, how to kind of commune with the other as this kind of shared somatic reality that we're all in, but also the micro of, you know, my personal ghost and how I kind of move through the bardos of this life um, and keep progressing. Interesting. Yeah. My take on that, if I may offer some metaphysical speculation as to what that ghost is. Sure. Is that um, it's comprised of processes and that some of these processes are um, like repeating patterns of information flows that you mostly created yourself, but a lot of them are intergenerational or some of them are actually due to your location. Um, and again, that same micro macro thing applies like some of the processes that are operating on a small scale uh, within yourself also apply on a large scale on multiple, perhaps fractal like uh, levels. And that uh, you see this a lot in various uh, mental disorders is that someone in a typically unpleasant situation will have built up some mental software in themselves to borrow a little bit from John C. Lilly. They've mm -hmm. made these processes that are well adapted to some really awful situation that they're in. But then once you get past a certain age, you're in a different location around different people, uh, those same columns of personality, uh, they're, they're holding up a roof that's collapsing or isn't even there anymore. So in a sense, this uh, stasis that you reach is when the processes that you've inherited from your environment and especially whoever raised you um, and perhaps the ones that, uh, processes that you've built up within yourself during your childhood, they only take you so far because uh, if you're lucky, your life is reasonably long. Uh, and then the only thing to do is to metaprogram the biocomputer. But then the issue is that the way in which you it occurs to you to change the processes within your own psyche is entirely dependent upon the processes that are already there. So you're using this broken, decaying architecture as uh, like a scaffold to build whatever new structure you're making. Uh, and it may not, those processes may not enable you to think of well-adapted ways to make yourself a new ghost. Right. And that's why through this, you know, this haunt manual, it's me um, documenting and ex experimenting these, you know, influences in different ways of which I am not wholly accustomed to, but I am, you know, kind of devout and attempting and trying. Um, and it also, you know, binds in with We the Hallowed and kind of these these ideas of um, like the tenets of it, of it as well, of, you know, finding um, an anarchic praxis, but finding also a community that, that kind of helps and inspires each other to enhance their anarchic processes, you know? So I've been, I know that a lot of the mental disfluencies that, you know, I um, wrestle with, um, I'm not, I'm not ejecting the progress of pharmacology or therapy. Um, you know, as Mitch Horowitz told me once, you know, you got to use every tool in the tool belt. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. And so it's also this idea of finding out what the things that I had lost along the way, the processes, the inspirations that I think got so bogged down by you know, just a, a, a heavy life lived in the past, you know, couple decades and kind of reacquainting myself with those things, but also, you know, building upon those rather than, you know, um, being, how do I put it? I'm not being egoic or, or like too confident about this in, in the sense that I think it's going to fix me. I'm coming about it more in a, in a journalistic aspect of you know i am spot am inspired to do this and i do see the benefit of what i've been doing uh for me personally and i do see how it you know it rhymes with my artistic practice and my metaphysical praxis um because prior and i write about this in the first chapter you know when i'm in the stasis i'll just think about everything to change or to exercise only 
and I'll think about things that I need to abandon or quit or run away from that may not be working. So now I'm looking at it in a way of communion where, you know, why is this coming up? Why does the stasis reach? What am I not listening to this demon that's barking at me, right? How do I name it? How do I commune with it? And then how do I either exercise it or, you know, find a good communion with that? So it goes into, you know, me. Uh, I've been working with this idea of divergent magic. It is more, you know, in tune with my neurodivergence and the difficulties that I have with kind of dogmatic and uh, presupposed currents of magic and but also needing to kind of commune with parts of those and find a daily routinization um, that not only informs me as a healthy human being but also as one that you know can correlate my spiritual praxis and my creative praxis in a very kind of not rigid but you know kind of more orderly aspect because it's either with me i'm very extremely extreme based and so <laughs> it's very it's it's all about this communion of finding you know that tether in between right that contradiction um and that's yeah that's kind of where i'm at with it but i do love what you're saying yes and i do think that a lot of times people will not only you know replace the decaying uh, you know, scaffolding with one of which they are just desperately trying to kind of involve themselves with to get out. But I feel like the decaying scaffolding needs also a sort of reverence in a way of, you know, taking it apart piece by piece instead of blowing it up, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to blow yourself up. Right. <laughs> or I mean, maybe, maybe in some interpretations of that, but it, it doesn't always go well. Right. So uh, I don't know how much you're comfortable with talking about the details of how this ontology that you're practicing works. Are you like, ident you made it sound at one point like you were identifying perhaps a, a list of archetypes that maybe you're calling tethers. Uh, I might be misinterpreting here. Yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, the tethers, I meant uh, is what we call kind of the um, tenets of We the Hallowed, which are very, very simple tenets. It's, you know, we're just all metaphysically minded creators that use, you know, metaphysical praxis to en enhance or inspire the creative praxis. And creativity to me is just the most, forgive me for saying, but like prag, magical, you know, um, identity for me as as both a creator and somebody that's trying to consult the other and so it's through just that very simple but extremely broad idea you know me and a, a lot of other international kind of creators and writers have you know um, created this artistic kind of collective and it's also it's also the frustrating part too, because it's hilarious to have an anarchic collective in and of itself. So it's also, you know, that's what I mean by tethers. It's like trying to find the, the continuations that I have from my personal uh, praxis and uh, consoling, I guess the contradiction that is uh, in, in all of the, what I do, but also in how I am tethered to others in a somatic way and and also you know in my history in negative ways um as you were talking about you know how i was brought up or you know all of these other interesting things that i think speak so loudly and everybody's um unique kind of artistic output right but it's also this big drive for me this hauntology of the self to kind of find a communion with the other literally like the another person another <laughs> like community so that's what i mean by tethers it's 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 also it's, it's specific in that it's the tenets of we the hollow but it's also the um you know the greater construct of what this shared reality is um as far as like the actual machinations of the practices um, there's a lot to get through. And the thing with the haunt manual is that I will be talking about it 
um, every chapter that I release and an audio cast. Uh, the next, this first chapter was basically an introduction or an overview. And the second chapter, I go actually deeper into uh, nostalgia mancy and my practices as, you know, the hauntology of the self and what I was talking about earlier, you know, with like little things like uh, trying to find these pathways to inspirational parts of the self uh, that I had since either closed up or forgot. Um, and I will, yeah, it'll be, uh, it's not a how to, I'm, I'm just going to share exactly what I do in a lot of degrees. I never like how to books. And I think the things that inspire me more are, are hearing kind of uh, personal uh, stories from creators and from magicians and, and all that and how they kind of consoled themselves within this world of which we all share. And that's what I'm planning to do with this, but it's also, you know, I will, I will talk deeply and more, um, I guess not, not clinically, but you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll talk more involved about what the machinations of each practice is as I had done with that Tim the Zimzum video um, and talking of my early audiomancy experiments. So it's a lot to get into. Um, I'm gonna, okay, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to go into it right now. I was just wondering. Oh, for sure. I, yeah. I feel like and, this is totally wrong, but I was imagining like a weird system where the tethers were personified as beings that you would like talk to and work with. That's really funny you say that. Um, yeah. And there there are personifications of the tethers and you know for general understanding sometimes i'll just use kind of the archetypical ideas of you know the tarot um to kind of illustrate such practices uh but i also have kind of my own created um creatures as i'll put them that kind of uh, are, are not unlike comic book uh, monsters or ideas of monsters that, you know, you must commune with, uh, you know, to kind of get the beauty of the whole. But I'll go into all of that in the next chapter, which will, should be coming out next month. Um, I'm not sure when this episode is coming out, but uh, uh, the first Haunt Manual chapter and episode will be out tomorrow night, which is Sunday, uh, I think the first or oh, 31st of july so it'll probably yeah. be like 10 months or something crazy for this okay well cool this will be a very hauntological chapter then about where i was um and explaining the genesis of this and how far i'll probably be through it by that time so that's super interesting yeah that is uh kind of micro macro mm -hmm. all right uh do you have some inspiration sources you'd like to share yeah, I mean, I can only buoy up the the uh, people that are around me that I absolutely adore. There's Eric J. Millar, um, who writes a column that's collected in the books uh, that we've put out through We the Hallowed Press, and it's called No Gods But My Own. And it's a very beautiful, he, he does everything, he, he kind of weaves the sinew between, you know, everything from comic books to his own personal like creation of, you know, egregores of, of deities that, you know, he works with. And it's very, it's anti-dogmatic, -dogma but it's also very um, beautifully illustrated, both figuratively and literally, um, his work. So I love that. Of course, you've had Luxa Strat on, love Luxa Cult podcast. It's a great, and her Green Mushroom Project is fascinating. Um, I should be submitting something for her uh, zine that's, coming out uh sometime in the next year um yeah and uh, derek hunter who i think you've had on um he's releasing his third book red um and his like alchemical kind of uh chaos riddle kind of you know prose trilogy that's uh coming out i think in august and he's just been a a wonderful um companion as all as all everyone i have mentioned um, but Derek's background in, you know, actual uh, recovery and how he parlays that into his love chaos um, practice is is just wonderful, and I think it's, it's it should be looked at. 
uh, closer. And I did appreciate your um, your episode with him. That was really cool. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I mean, those are the three that come to mind. Obviously, Michelle Embry, who I think is uh, just a wonderful writer. She just wrote a book um, called Daydream Tarot, um, which is, to me, one of the book I will give as an introduction to tarot from here on out. Um, Why is that? It's also a workbook and just the way that she illustrates it and breaks it down for somebody that's, you know, trying to get used to the major arcana. Um, I just think is just uh, wonderfully erudite and well put. And it's also, she's just a really talented and biting writer. Uh, she has a podcast called secret antenna, which is really great. Um, and they talk more about, you know, kind of, uh, not, it's not tarot based. I'll just put it that way. Um, and yeah, uh, forgive me anyone who's listening to this, if I forgot you, but these, these are the people that, the, that I, I kind of bounce ideas off of and, you know, um, have been very prevalent in my life as of late as, you know, those tethers, they are the tethers really, um, of, you know, this wonderful back and forth and, um, yeah. And they're all just incredible artists and magicians in their own right. For sure. Yeah. I had not heard of Michelle Embry before, so I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. She's wonderful. She's a great writer. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm trying to think other, there's so many I can think of, <laughs> um, it just sounds like I'm on a promotion escapade, but that's, that's okay. true. Part you of the should... show is about helping people find people that are hard to find. Like I, I would never have found Derek Hunter if I hadn't been just like deep diving on small tags on Instagram. So I hope oh, this podcast makes it a little bit easier for people to find, uh, people <laughs> making weird stuff. And that's what it's all about. It's, you know, I've just been surrounding myself with people making weird stuff. And I do think it's funny that, you know, with Haunt Manual or whatever I'm doing, it may not be breaking any new doors um, or anything, but it's just, it's such a testament to, you know, the, the influences around me at this modern moment too. And everyone that has really kind of inspired me in both the practical and the metaphysical sides of life so yeah those are the ones obviously you've got a whole litany of um ideas and artists and things i'll be writing about within haunt manual uh the first chapter talks about uh, my favorite character actor timothy carey who i got the name dakota slim from when i was 14 or 13 and um his work uh world's greatest center which was scored by a nascent frank zappa uh before he was you know the frank zappa and it, it it goes on from there about all of these folks that were inside the confines of kind of a mainstream circuitry but were able to really commune with that you know that anarchic ghost within them to create these wonderful works that i think are overshadowed and and not shared a lot so you know, I'll be talking about a lot of those influences, plus a lot of musical ones. And and uh, I might even throw in some reviews here and there. Who knows? Um, this thing is fluid and odd as it is. So I'm just going to keep on that track. Yeah, I love it. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Yeah, actually, I want to introduce you to my father, who... Tom Ross, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he works a lot within transhumanism, albeit not in more of your kind of technosis idea of it. He's not really concerned with living forever. He's he's actually writing uh, books that are like AI um, in like uh, how do I put it? Like he's uh, he's working with an AI that's that's he's trying to make you know kind of an emotional um writer for a book trilogy that he's reading or he's writing and i thought you two would have a lot to talk about so i'll send you uh some links he uh he does a lot of work in that and to his credit he when i was a kid and when i'd visit him he was on 
we was living with Marilyn, or he was he was around Marilyn Ferguson's compound, where Robert Anton Wilson was and Timothy Leary. And you mentioned John Lilly, and he knew John Lilly, and all of that. So uh, that was always a big influence in my life. Um, and it was funny because the contradiction was, you know, I'd go back to Arizona with a very <laughs> disciplined but aloof. Um, desert upbringing. So that contrast is something that I talk about as well. But he, I think you two would hit it off, especially with, um, you know, I, I sent him your book and he he was like, wow, no, I hadn't heard of this. And so he's he's hopefully diving into it, but I think you two would have a great conversation. Yeah, sounds like it. Hmm. Yeah. So he's... Uh... He is he training AI to write a book? You said some sort of emotional connection. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not good with that vernacular. It's not something. Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that I'm. I'm. I've. You know, I'm in. I'm out in the forest most of the day. Um, <laughs> so, um, cool. but yeah, I'll have to but, rely on his description of it. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to butcher it, but from what I've gathered, you know, he's written a um, a very metaphysical um kind of fiction and i believe in the third book it's he's actually consulting with an ai that is helping him write it i know one of the books was written for ai to um i don't know to help kind of machine learning um or that was like a a back process of it but i yeah, I just don't want to. I don't want to butcher his elevator pitch because obviously I'm not good at mine. So, <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. I don't know. Just to spitball off of that, it reminds me of a time where, do you know Alistair Crowley's um, Visions of the Aethers? Like, is Enochian working? I know of it. I haven't read it. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I I fed it into. I guess it it was a uh, Inferkit. They have. Uh, it's a different model. It's not GPT three, but it's pretty similar. It's like eleven billion megaton something. But it uh Yeah, I had to like format it and mess with it in order to get it to be something for AI to read. And then I had hmm. like this little AI module that you could um you could hit enter and it would like randomly spew Crowley style Enochian uh visions. Is that what was that the basis of the book that you had written? No, um, that was me Technosis experimenting. Okay. That was me experimenting after GPT three Technosis because I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to just keep writing the same book, right. and uh, so I wanted to see just using the same kind of generative text AI. What kinds of things you could feed it? Because while I was writing GPT three Technosis, it was always. I was feeding in prior parts of the book in order to prime it to go the direction I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was experimenting with using other magical or visionary texts and it didn't really, it didn't really do it for me. I didn't feel like I had that ghost in the machine like I did sure. with GPT three technosis. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I've, I've worked with, we've experimented with, you know, the like cut up kind of machines. Um, and, you know, just working the parameters and there is something there. I'm just not, I just haven't found like a good communion with and how to play with these sorts of things. You know, there's a, uh, there's that sigil uh, generator um, that a lot of folks were talking about for a while. And it just felt to me like losing the physical praxis of, you know, kind of writing it down and creating it um, was just a, it's a whole different adds a whole different value to it that I thought was super interesting. And it's like working in perfect communion with that ghost in the machine that's creating a sigil for you, you know? So I have yet to like really experiment with any of that. What I do a lot with my audio Mancy practices is I'll, you know, record, uh, uh, audio Mancy sh sessions of me, you know, kind of in a, trance chanting and hitting things uh, sporadically and like a dark room that I call a dim my dimming room and I'll just hit record on a cassette tape and 
kind of you know I'll maybe even have like a tape delay thing just kind of emitting a tone or a frequency and then i'll just be hitting and doing random stuff but then i will digitize that and i'll cut it up and uh sequence the samples so like in a lot of the dakota slim music all of the percussion as like kitchen sync percussion you're hearing is from those sessions that i've kind of worked with technology to kind of syncopate in a way and uh yeah kind of become the the genesis of a new song right um but i've I've always loved that's that's kind of how i've worked with computers in a creative or like a a metaphysical way but i have yet to really dive deep down into the 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 bellies of which you reside in but it seems really neat. Yeah, it, I, I will admit it's it's very, it can be hit or miss. Like you're not necessarily gonna get what you want. <laughs> right. It, it, sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't click. Kind of like with astral projection, like some people are really good at astral projecting, but most people, maybe 50% of the time, if they're decent at it, they astral project. And then the other 50% of the time, they're kind of just like, laying there yes yeah it's like me with lucid dreaming really good at it when i can do it (laughs) yeah Yeah. pretty much i will say something that i'm working on right now Uh, all the magical part of it is done so i'm comfortable talking about it is um i'm using dolly to so to preface um i make video rituals where the the ritualistic components to the creation of the rich of the video but the video itself is a tool for performing a ritual. Like you can, um, I think of them as like Tibetan prayer wheels. Like you can let it play, right. especially on repeat and you can trance out to it or you can just contemplate it, whatever. But uh, a lot of my videos have me dancing around uh, with various video textures layered over my body. Uh, and I'm doing this kind of dance buto that I do with magical intent, right? Mm-hmm. So what I've done is I've taken stills of me from uh, Buto recordings and I fed them into an AI that will generate more images that look like that still, just like me standing in different positions using Dolly 2. And then uh, Dolly 2 doesn't make videos and right now there's no AI that can coherently animate. Like you can't just type in a person dancing a waltz and get a video of someone actually dancing a waltz. Right. It doesn't know, it doesn't understand how to like single move images. Limbs. Yeah. Yes. So then I fed all these other single images into uh, another software Topaz to get like a bunch of in-betweens for like animation. So you get a uh purely I guess the initial image was me, but from like one snapshot you can get as many minutes of AI dancing that looks like me. Very cool. Yeah, the the in betweens. Yeah. Yeah. Like what the Koreans do for animation in the States. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it all comes back to like these initial initial snapshots of ritual. I love it. And that's that's almost a, a very cool transposition of what I was saying that I was doing with working, you know, in the physical construct of time and space and creating something and then having it, you know, transposed into, you know, these kind of digital engines to kind of create the whole piece. That's, I love that. That's to me, that's, um, again, you know, that's working with those extremes and, and finding that in between, which it's really interesting. I, um, I love that you work with video, especially because it's something I've, I've done with, uh, I have an old Sony, uh, like Panasonic Hi8 camera that I plug into a, a projector, right? And sometimes in these audiomancy things, I'll have it face me so it does the infinite like loop, you know, when it's seeing itself and, you know, work with that in the dark uh, with music. And I've captured some of it, but I've always um, in the back of my mind wanted to experiment more with what to do with that footage now and how do would I create, um, you know, what kind of closes that circle 
And mm-hmm. that's a really neat idea of, you know, uh, generating these, the Dolly 2 stuff um, of your own movements and then animating them digitally through an algorithm, right? And then piecing it together. Yeah. I will say um, my initial steps into what you're talking about was making video textures where Mm -hmm. um, let's just say you have a video of a part of a ritual or something that has symbolic meaning to you. You can layer over itself like, I don't know, 10 or 20 times with different blending layers or like key out different colors of it so that you can, you obscure it in the same way that when you make a sigil, you might cross out letters and rearrange. Right. And then once you have this uh, video texture that has symbolic meaning to you, you can layer it onto something else. Yeah, I've seen are those what you use for the visual kind of components of these audio casts on YouTube. Uh, yeah, the yeah the one for this podcast was um, generated with a bunch of key terms about like video art and experimental music and stuff like that, but then layered over itself a bunch of times. Yeah, very cool. It definitely has a a breathing aspect to it that I always liked uh, when I was when I looked at yours for the Luxa or the Derek videos, it's, it's got a very kind of human syncopation to it. It it looks like it's breathing in a way, which really spoke out to me as a, an element of something that I always really loved when I see those kind of textures interact like that. And also, you know, from psychonautic experience, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. You know, there are actually like human faces deep in there. If you look, they're hard to find. Oh. But like if I, you if you stare at it long enough, you'll see like faces gliding around. There are actually faces buried in there. Very cool. I'll have to blow it up on the TV and really inspect it. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. We I did something similar for the big, uh, not as intricate as yours, but for our big audio sigil that we put out for We The Hallowed that, it's like 17 tracks and everyone submitted kind of something for it. Um, and then I pieced it all together uh, sonically and produced it into like a perfect loop. Um, but then I wanted to do a video component for it. And so kind of in that testament of this idea of, uh, you know, inspirations, right. Uh, or influences. I just basically mangled, um, public domain you know silent films and things uh together into one long video um unfortunately i didn't go as deep as i maybe would have liked to with the processing and everything just because it was such a big undertaking um but i really want to experiment more with with that and say even you know if for the video component for the haunt manual like as you were saying, doing the Dolly twos of Timothy Carey or, you know, Jacques Derrida and kind of malforming them and having them breathe behind would be super interesting to do. So, hmm. yeah, like that would that. be cool. And it would let you get like a bunch of never before seen pictures that look kind of like Timothy Carey or whoever. <laughs> right. And there's always an aspect of an, the other kind of with those generated There's there's that uncanny valley, which People tend to not like, but I actually, I love it. It's just so mutant and unnatural that it, I actually I actually really enjoy those, you know, kind of uncanny valley type malformations within AI generated things. So, yeah, it looks I, like something that a human would not have made. Exactly. And I think that's the point. I think when people are working within AI and tech or in music, when they're trying to make something digital sound organic i think that's that's uh it it just misses what you can do with it if you just like laid into it being not organic you know what i mean yeah Uh, (laughs) my my tone of voice indicates that i kind of want both so like to to um to go back to the video art since most of the people watching this will be seeing it on youtube and i will say for anyone listening this is also on spotify and anchor fm but um, my first attempts at making video textures, I did in an analog sense. Like I would drop ink into water 
and record that or like I did stuff with um, vinegar and baking soda and food coloring because I wanted to have organic motions. Right. And prior to having AI generated video, you you weren't really going to use computers to get things that had organic motion to them, except yeah. for maybe, I guess, fractals or something. Was that what Andy Warhol used for like the exploding plastic inevitable, like uh, filters on live projections? He would take buckets of water and oil and vinegar and things and kind of move it over the projections. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but. That's what springs no, to I mind. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, but, it's the uh, old Velvet yeah. Underground performances. But sorry, didn't mean. Didn't no, mean that's to cool. Drop. Yeah, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's kind of gross, but I, I, it made me think of there is a, another chemical reaction piece he did, where I think it was like a giant copper plate that he had yep. anyone who uh, who walked into the factory, which was like his art warehouse. Uh, anyone who wanted to could, I guess, piss on it. Yep. And it would like react. And um, I am really interested in the way chemical reactions move because they're organic, but they're not they're not animal. They're not of humanity. And that's one of my favorite things about current generations of AI is they don't really simulate humanity. They're not human. The way they they generate text or they speak some some of the text to speech stuff is OK or the way they make music. It, it has an organicism to it, but it's not it's not of humanity. It's not of the animal kingdom. Right. And when it yeah. comes to audio, same thing. If you make all of your original audio samples digitally, um, it, it does kind of have a hollow sound to it, which <laughs> maybe is a, a useful pun off of your, uh, your organization. <laughs> but I well, think it works better yeah. most of the time for what I like to start with analog audio because there's a yes. lot of detail that you just don't get purely. Digital. Yeah. And I do like all of my samples are my own and are analog. I was just meaning of like, it, and it, I guess it just comes with whatever. Yeah. You're right about both because you know, a, um, I don't know, a VST sounding like a Rhodes doesn't, quite sound like a Rhodes and it's very notice noticeable to me but at the same time if it was used for the intents and purposes to not sound exactly like a Rhodes then I think that unlocks like a really wonderful like schemata of what you could do with with things if if you are communing again with both kind of ideas but I'm yeah, with you I sense. you know and like I a bad cover band <laughs> yeah exa exactly yeah um, and sometimes bad cover by bands are, are fun or, you know, that's the intent. I guess that's what it comes down to. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, in, in my processes with digital manipulation, I will still, even though they're my samples that I'm now cutting up and kind of, you know, syncopating uh, digitally, they're still analog. But at the same time, I will still choose to pencil them in or play them and trigger them instead of say quantizing them um because it's still important to me to just be off in a human element um rhythmically instead of like completely on point um in a in a digital kind of facet if that makes sense yeah it does yeah all right well we're approaching uh i guess we're a little past the one hour mark is there anything else that you'd like to plug or you can recap things that you've already plugged to um, yeah, so uh, Prag Magic will now be, it'll be kind of a free-for-all. You'll hear some Audiomancy experiments on it. You will get the Haunt Manual in audio form. It's everywhere. Something happened with Spotify. Hopefully when this comes out, I'll have it fixed. But for some reason, most of my episodes are gone from Spotify, um, but are available everywhere else pods are casted. So I'm sure I'll get that sorted by the time this comes out. Um, Haunt Manual will also be on wethehallowed.org which is our big kind of hub for all of the international artists and haunts of We the Hallowed uh, to post their disparate works of art, their writings, their videos, their music, what have you. So that's going strong. Um, let's see. I will also be doing Audiomancy live streams. I've been working in tandem with video and streaming um, 
to try to get some more combustible media done because there is something I really do enjoy about having both the very produced edited things, but also the kind of off the cuff, uh, free rolling things. And I think with streaming, I've found an equilibrium I like. So I also do those for Patreon, but you know, you'll get some of those, um, topic based, but maybe not topic based in the future. Um, Dakota slim, uh, I'm finishing the book that is accompanying the end of Dakota Slim's tenure as my solo artistic output musically, and uh, hopefully that'll be done by the time this comes out, but it's kind of my big white whale on that front. So um, yeah, there'll be more original music around there, and I think just, yeah, follow me on Instagram and uh, Twitter, although I'm... a notoriously bad social media user um i do promote things that are happening uh whether it be live shows or releases so it's at pragmagic underscore cast and pragmagic.com and that's pragmagic with a k it was great having you on keats yeah thank you so much